Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines, Ugandan opposition candidate Bobby Wine to mount legal challenge against presidential res- election results. Palestine set to hold legislative and presidential elections after 15 years. Many arrested in Tunisia during protests against worsening economic crisis. And finally, in our video section, we look at the US diplomatic assault on Cuba and its implications. In our first story, Ugandan opposition frontrunner Bobby Wine has announced that he will challenge President Yoweri Museveni's electoral victory in court. Museveni was declared the winner of the January 14th elections amid allegations of rigging and anti-opposition violence. The elections were held under a countrywide internet shutdown and a ban on all social media platforms. The election commission declared Museveni the winner with 58.64% of the votes on January 16th. Bobby Wine was second with a vote share of 34.83%. The Chief of the Election Commission had previously stated that the results would arrive at the National Tally Centre, not to the local internet but to the Commission's own system. However, no details regarding the system were provided. Wine first raised allegations of fraud and rigging on January 15 during the announcement of the provisional results. The Ugandan military proceeded to surround his house and subsequently entered it. He has since been placed under conditions of house arrest and is unable to contact party officials or journalists. A member of parliament, Francis Zaki, was also arrested and beaten for trying to reach his residence and had to be hospitalized. Security forces also raided the offices of Wine's party, the National Unity Platform, today. The month leading up to Thursday's elections witnessed a sustained and violent crackdown on the opposition by the administration of President Museveni, who has been in power since 1986. Irregularities and delays witnessed at the polling booths on election day were also consistent with similar reports from previous elections. The African Union was reported the only organization to send monitors for the election as the EU and UN were not permitted to observe the proceedings. In our next story, Palestine is said to hold its first legislative and presidential elections in 15 years. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas issued a decree to this effect on Friday, January 15th. Legislative elections are scheduled to be held across the occupied West Bank, Gaza and East Jerusalem on May 22nd. These will be followed by the presidential election scheduled for July 31st. The announcement follows the start of a reconciliation process among Palestinian factions over long-standing tensions. Rifts had emerged after the Fatah-led Palestinian Authority government announced its decision to resume security coordination with Israel last year. Fatah subsequently also did not participate in a joint military exercise along with other groups including Hamas. Despite this, Hamas has issued a statement welcoming the announcement of elections. And nonetheless, concerns remain around the election process in occupied East Jerusalem, which has been annexed by Israel as part of its idea of an undivided eternal capital. Palestinian Election Commission Chairman Hana Nasir has stated that while there may not be guarantees regarding Jerusalem, there do exist precedents. Palestinians had participated in elections held in 1996 and 2006. Israel is yet to officially respond to the election announcement. Two million Palestinians will be eligible to vote in the upcoming elections. A 25% quota had also been reserved for women candidates in the 132-member national parliament. Palestinian factions will reportedly meet next week in Egypt's capital Cairo to participate in further talks regarding the elections. The Election Commission will initiate a five-day process of voter registration on February. We now go to Tunisia where protests entered the third day as thousands gathered across the country on January 17th amid a worsening economic crisis. People first took to the streets following an announcement of a renewed lockdown starting from January 14th. Protests also grew following the release of the video footage of a police beating a shepherd in the city of Siliana on January 15th. As protests spread to nearly 15 cities, police forces deployed tear gas and water cannons in places to suppress the crowds. A spokesperson for the Interior Ministry has stated that over 600 people, including minors, have been arrested by the authorities so far. Tunisia's domestic economic conditions have worsened under the COVID-19 epidemic. The country's GDP shrank by 9% in 2020, with crucial sectors of tourism and unemployment being the worst hit. The prices of essential commodities and consumer products have increased rapidly, while approximately one-third of the country's youth is unemployed. The country is now also facing a second wave of COVID-19 infections, as fresh cases have risen significantly. 2,589 new cases and 76 deaths were recorded in the country on January 17th. The protests also coincided with the 10th anniversary of the revolution, which ousted the corrupt and undemocratic regime of Zainal Abdin Ben Ali. However, the persistence of low economic growth and lack of adequate public services continue to affect large parts of the country. In our final story, we look at some of the recent decisions of the Trump administration, which has gone on a diplomatic warpath. Last week, it initiated measures to put Cuba on the list of countries sponsoring terrorism and also sanctioned the minister. News Clicks Prabir Purkaisa analyzes the impact of these decisions. And uh, Cuba facing imperial onslaughts for the longest time. And we see that re- the recent announcement that they've started the process to put Cuba on the list of countries supporting terrorism. 
And this had been removed earlier during the Obama administration. Now the attempt to bring it back, whether it will be actual, whether it will actually happen or not is a different question because the procedures may take some time. But more importantly, what we see again is that despite Cuba's amazing service to the world during the COVID-19 pandemic, nonetheless, the U.S. strategy over the decades is still being intensified right now. Well, you know, Cuba is, of course, has has always been in the crosshairs of the United States because it's a holdout. It represents a kind of history which the Latin Americans respect, rever, and that reverence that you can stand up as a small country, you can stand up to the you know, might of the United States, which has you know a number of new colonies and has had the Monroe Doctrine earlier, a whole set of things which reduced Latin America to near colonial status, that Cuba could break from it and chart a new course. So that is the, you know, the, the attraction that Cuba has for Latin America. So it's not Cuba so much as the fact what it represents right. that is uh, under attack. So if they can overthrow Cuba, then they think they will have removed that center of dissent to American dominance of the South Americas, which is what, or the Central Americas for that matters. So this is the, really the reason why Cuba has always been under attack and it's been intensified with Trump administration because they don't want any normalcy in this part of the world. Right. But more than that, they want essentially the Bolivarian revolution to fail. And that is the other part of it. The Cuba is an ideological guarantee of some sort against the kind of ideological onslaught that has been lodged by the United States and its allies. And you have a whole bunch of them in Latin America which are trying to turn the wheel of history in the opposite direction. Now, Venezuela is, of course, a classic uh, issue. Ecuador is another. But you have also Argentina, you have also Chile. So there is a whole bunch of countries where the right versus left is uh, coming issues coming up and knocking Cuba out in the Cuban doctors, the nurses, as you talked about the COVID-19 help that Cuba has provided to different parts of the world. This is something that they need to dislodge because you see this is one picture. What is the other picture? The American vaccine nationalism at its worst. We will take care of ourselves. The devil take the hindmost. And if any vaccine is left over, we will charge exorbitant amounts of money for delivering it to the next, uh, right. to other parts of the world. This is the philosophy with which it is developing. And you can see Cuba is at the moment. It has four vaccines that it is testing out. Unfortunately, Cuba doesn't have the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic, unlike the United States and the UK and parts of Europe. So they have a difficult task where to actually test it out. The same problem the Chinese also had. But you can see that the approach of the Cubans right. has been, this is for the world, this is not for us. Unlike the United States, which is really, we will have it first, and then we will see how much we can fleece the rest of the world. And I think that is the kind of ideological issue which really accentuates what the Cubans stand for and what the U.S. stand for. And of course, tr again, trying to queer the pitch in any thaw in Latin America by targeting uh, Cuba. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.